Okay, we're back in the continuation of uh, Billy being shown how the device inside the Pleiadian ship can actually read the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. And Billy's just demonstrated that he understands it and that she's quite surprised that he can really understand it as well as he does. And she says, yeah, we can, through this device, listen to the conscious mind and the subconscious mind of any individual that we think about. And the subconscious mind contains information about your future because the future that you are creating for yourself is being created all the time in your subconscious mind and your conscious mind is not aware of it. Now that's an important point for all of us. We're always hearing how we should create our own future and take responsibility for ourselves. Well, apparently we're doing it all the time anyway without even our own awareness. That our subconscious mind is at all times creating a future. And by creating a future, what I mean is that it's making plans for what it wants to do, what you want to do. Your subconscious mind is making plans for the next few days on what it wants to do, and your conscious mind is not even aware of it yet. Your conscious mind kind of gets the news later on when it's time to do something, so to speak, or whenever your conscious mind actually turns to the subconscious and tries to tune into it. But here we have a device that can tune into your subconscious mind and then read what that subconscious mind is thinking of doing in the future. Now, how far ahead in this future, I don't know. But here, the device is reading Hans's mind because in two days' time, Hans was planning on calling Billy. And on the screen, suddenly, they see Hans uh, picking up the telephone to call Billy to arrange a meeting to come over and talk about doing these lectures and so forth. So Billy's very surprised that on the screen he can actually see the future, see Hans doing something in the future, and all this is being read through Hans' subconscious. He doesn't even know yet that in two days he's going to suddenly decide to call Billy to do this. But his subconscious mind, two days previous to that event, has already decided that he wants to do it. Well, Billy's a little surprised. Says, "Gee, with this device, you guys can know pretty much anything." And she says, "Yeah, we can. We have to be very careful so we don't misuse this knowledge. But it gives us the ability to pretty much look into the thoughts, feelings, and future of about anyone that we want to." And Billy says, "Well, could I give it a try?" And she says, "Sure, go ahead. You seem to understand the symbols pretty well. What do you want to do?" <clears throat> so he puts his <clears throat> excuse me he puts his hand on the the world ball he called it in the notes it's called a world ball I don't know if it looked like the earth or just a round ball and uh, <clears throat> she says well think about whoever you want to see on the screen and uh, he does and he says well <clears throat> the person I'm going to see on here he says I'm going to be thinking about uh, General Francisco Franco of Spain and he begins to think about that and she, uh, she says well, okay now this button right here next to the ball push the button and he pushes this button or depresses this little whatever it is there and on the screen suddenly uh, he's seeing these symbols which represent the subconscious mind uh, of Francisco Franco and then he switches something and you can see the conscious mind of Francisco and Billy's reading the symbols which depict the information from Franco's conscious mind and he says wow look at this this fella is scared to death I mean he's really in fear what's he afraid of and he reads some more symbols that are moving across the screen and he says I understand now this poor devil is afraid of dying he's afraid to death he's going to die matter of fact he's terrified he's trembling and if any of you will remember back in that time period that General Francisco Franco was dying at that time and ultimately did die about a month after that. Well, Billy switches it over to the subconscious and he's kind of surprised. And he says, well, look, this is entirely different. The, the subconscious mind is not afraid. The subconscious mind is not terrified at all. And he kind of stops for a second. He says, I don't get it. The conscious mind is terrified, afraid of death, and the subconscious mind is very peaceful. What's going on? And Semyasi says, well, that's very simple. The subconscious mind is directly connected to creation, and the subconscious mind knows that death is no terror at all. And Billy kind of has a realization. He says, oh, of course, I understand. The subconscious mind, which is directly hooked to your spiritual abilities, which is directly hooked to creation all the time, is aware that death is no great horror, that it's simply a step into a new, a new evolution, you might call it. It's the continuation of an evolution. It's just a step forward in your growth. So it wouldn't be terrified at all. 
<clears throat> but his subconscious mind, he says, look in here, I see this, that the subconscious mind knows that he's going to have a heart attack soon. And he starts to give the date, and Simyasi stops him. She says, don't say the date out loud, because we don't want it in your notes. I don't want you to say the date out loud. And uh, he says, why? And she says, well, we don't call the dates out on events like this, future dates on people, because they don't really want to affect events. They don't want it in his notes where people would be reading about it. Now, a heart attack probably wouldn't be uh, uh, something that would have any effect anyway, but it's a general um, trend or general way of doing things with them that they don't reveal things about the future exactly because they don't want to have effect on them. They apparently have got to a point technically where they can see the future events of people and of nations and of planets, but they don't like to take responsibility for events happening. So they're very careful, morally careful, about not changing any of those events by actually you know, putting information out about them, which would cause people to react differently than they normally would. So uh, Billy doesn't call the date out, but right after the contact, he goes home, and he writes this letter down. It's October 20th, and he writes a letter down with the date and everything in it and sends it to Hans and tells Hans not to open the letter till November 20th, which Hans does. He gets the letter. He receives the letter and opens it up, and in it is an explanation all about this device and the contact that Billy has just had and all the information about Franco and that he will die on November 20th. And so they were able to see the date actually exactly right on the machine, and they have this device then that reads our subconscious. Okay, and a couple of tapes back, I mentioned that uh, Simyasi was explaining to Billy about the occurrences in the Bermuda Triangle. And she explained exactly what was causing this, that it was the radiation from a couple of very large suns that were putting a small rip in time in certain areas on the Earth. And because of that, ships would disappear and slip off into different time realms. Billy had more questions about that later on, and she says, well, we will have an opportunity very soon that we will be able to show you exactly how that works. Well, apparently they had reason to go into another dimension, and after they explained to Billy exactly what dimensions are at one particular time, uh, an opportunity did come up for him to be shown exactly what's in the Bermuda tri uh, Triangle dimensions door. So she picked Billy up, and she was in her ship, and she explained to them that to remember the drawing that she had made for him that showed the cyclone-shaped swirl, which is the shape of what a dimensions door actually looks like and how they get into it. And she, they flew into the area where the Bermuda Triangle is, and they proceeded to head into the dimensions door. She says they're not going to be going in exactly to the same dimension uh, where these people slip off into. Normally when you go through a dimensions door without any equipment or apparatus to protect you, then you would just slide right into a future Earth situation. But that's not exactly where they were going to go. Uh, by the way, the one that the uh, ships and people and so forth have slipped into seems to be far in the Earth future, someplace we don't know exactly how far. But they're not going into that particular dimension's frame. They're going to go in control more with instruments and the radiation shields that protect the ship. So they're going into a different, uh, it's the same dimension door, but they seem to have control of where they go. And they're going into a certain area where there's been an accident where there are three Earths all in one dimension. Now here we only have one Earth in our dimension that we live in, uh, so it would be a little unusual to uh, go into a dimension where there are three Earths. There is a future Earth, 470 years in our future, and there is a uh, primitive or prehistoric Earth, and then there's one existing in, like in the very, very primitive stages just in the gas ball sort of um, era, I guess you'd call it. So they proceed to go into the dimension, and Billy's looking on the screens inside of the ship and up ahead of him. He proceed to go into the dimension, and Billy's looking on the screens inside of the ship and up ahead of him. He sees exactly what Simyasi had drawn for him, this dimensions door that looks like a swirling cyclone somehow. looks like kind of like what a tornado would look like if you were flying right into the funnel of it. And as he's looking into the dimensions door, he sees the other dimension up in front as he's looking. And if he turns around and looks just behind him out the back of the ship, he would see the present day Earth. So at one particular point you would see both, the dimension that we are in and the dimension that he would fly into. They fly on into that and as they get inside she's explaining to him about three different Earths that are present in there. 
and he notices that uh, Pata's great spacer ship is already in there. And uh, she explains to Billy that, yes, that uh, another extraterrestrial race that has space travel also, one of their ships had flown into this particular dimension, but somehow was having equipment problems or did not have the right equipment. It couldn't get back out, and they were going to go in and try to uh, get him out of there. And while they were there, they invited Billy to go along so he could see this. So they did. They're in there, and she's explaining the different uh, planets and what they looks like, what they look like, and she flies into the area where the primitive Earth is. Well, uh, Billy's getting kind of excited because she's saying primitive, and he's uh, thinking, oh, yeah, do they have these, like, uh, prehistoric animals, saurians and so forth on there? And she says, yes, as a matter of fact, we knew that you'd be excited about that, so we're going to allow you the opportunity to actually put on some sort of protective suit that they had made, and Billy would be able to get out and see these primitive animals and take pictures of them. Earlier on a tape, I had mentioned that when Billy was taking the great uh, spacer trip, when he traveled with them to different planets, that they went by a planet that had very large prehistoric animals on it and he wanted to get out and take a picture of the animals there and I suggested I thought maybe he did but I remember he did not it was on this particular trip into the Bermuda Triangles dimension where they actually provided him with a suit well they hook up with Pata's ship and Billy once again gets to talk to Pata for a little bit and he's telling him yeah we have brought a couple of suits that Pata will go out on the primitive planet with Billy and uh, just see the animals, and Billy's going to get a chance to take pictures and so forth, which he does. He gets a few pictures of uh, different reptilian creatures and saurian birds, and he even gets a picture, uh, he has Simyasi take a picture of him and Pata together on the planet. So uh, after they've done that, there's another Earth there also, and this is a future Earth. And Billy's saying, you mean the uh, planet Earth actually has a future, huh? He says, yeah, this is a future Earth that exists 470 years in our future. At this particular time, the Earth people have already developed stations and cities on the moon and other planets. And she says, we'll go visit the moon now. And she flies uh, up to the moon. And Billy can see there are small cities and settlements, and they spend some time in uh, different areas on the moon, and he takes a few pictures. And he's kind of surprised that the Earth people have actually developed that far. And she says, yes, uh, almost 500 years has passed, and by now they've had the capabilities of designing ships similar to our beam ships. And they have uh, interplanetary travel now. She says, also, we have to be very careful that even though the Earth people are far more peaceful than they used to be, they're very aggressive, and that if her ship was to be noticed, uh, that uh, certainly that they would probably try to force her to land, and that'd be in a very uncomfortable position for her. So she was being careful not to be detected at any time by the, you know, the current Earth people there. Um, after they go around the moon, they actually fly down to the planet Earth, and they spend, uh, actually it says about seven hours, they fly around the uh, current future Earth there, and Billy's taking pictures and seeing different sections on the Earth, and uh, she's showing him all around about what the future of Earth is going to look like, but there's no comments in the contact notes really about that, so we don't get any clues as to what may particularly lie in our future there. They fly back to the Great Spacer and hook up there once again, and uh, while they're waiting for Pata, Billy has a few questions. And one is about the lifespan. And he uh, had remembered that Simyasi had told him that the lifespan of the Pleiadians was averaging around a thousand years. And uh, would there be any way possible that current day Earth people could achieve something like that? And she said, uh, yes, there is, not only through uh, medical breakthroughs and technology and so forth, but there are also other ways to control the lifespan. She says that our ancestors who lived here on Earth long ago, our early ancestors who had come from different planets, understood more about that. They also understood a lot more about creation and how the energy of creation can be used by spirit forms like ourselves to do many different things. And lifespan was one of the things that was possible. She says that through an understanding of how creation works, and through an understanding that we have a spirit and how to use the spiritual powers, that a person who is knowledgeable in the spiritual laws can actually control their lifespan somewhat. What happens is, she says, when you think in accordance with the natural and creational laws, you create some sort of special high-frequency radiation that oscillates in a certain uh, way, that, so it creates some immense force. And this is generated by your spirit. And this force that you generate yourself by the, the way that you think influences the cells of your body and you live a lot longer. 
that our early ancestors here living back previous to 10,000 years ago were averaging, like I said, over 1,007 years of age. So uh, definitely something there for us to try to work on. One of the problems with religion is that it keeps this from happening. Since religion does not teach about what the spirit is and the power of your own personal spirit, that we're never going to stumble onto that or you know, develop those sort of abilities through religion. She says that the earth man must also become aware of the fact that how you think is how you feel and how you look. The most all of our illnesses on earth are created by virtue of how we think. If you think negative and destructive, then you will create yourself to looking poorly and you will get sick easily. However, if you uh, think very positively and are of a balanced spiritual type person, you will live longer and you will look better. Also, on the Pleiadian worlds, they don't have large cities, and one of the main reasons is that it's not conducive to this, the right kind of energy. If you have a large mass of people in a large city area like we do, for instance, in Los Angeles, that will shorten your lifespan because of all the thoughts that are released. We know living just here in the Los Angeles area with all the problems in the inner city and all the anger and so forth that goes on in this town, that those thoughts are being released and they do have effect on all of us. As evidenced in nature, she drew attention to the fact that iron normally doesn't rust on its own. We think that iron just naturally oxidizes from the oxygen. But she says actually thought has a lot to do with it, that iron will rust uh, different levels of rust at different parts of the world depending on how the people in that area think. And I thought about that, and that's true. You know, there is iron in certain places in India in those areas that does not rust. They have iron poles and construction there that's been there for several thousand years and no rust on those at all. But iron rests pretty good here in Los Angeles. Also, precious stones, crystals, and things like that we have to be more careful with because they are more powerful at storing negative energies, and they can be harmful and destructive to individuals also. Correct thinking isn't necessarily like being very positive about things, and it isn't being real negative about things. Correct thinking is being a balanced thinker, being able to control your thoughts so you don't get real positive or real negative. Billy had a couple of questions, too, about Hyperboreans, that he had heard that certain race of people called Hyperboreans were living under uh, Mount Shasta in California and wanted to know if that was true, if there really was a race called Hyperboreans. He had read that in the, during the time of Enoch that these extraterrestrials had come here and wanted to know where they lived. And she said, yes, that's true, that there are Hyperboreans living under Mount Shasta uh, in northern California as well as the Aleutian Islands and up in Alaska. The Hyperboreans originally, when they came here, lived in the area that now we call Florida, which is one of the states, of course, here in the United States. At that time, though, the Earth was in a slightly different position. Uh, if you can imagine the Earth, for instance, is looking down at it and see where Florida is, and then if you suddenly roll the planet up, so Florida moved up to where Greenland is right now, that's the position that the planet was in back in those particular times. It was up in the area where Greenland is now. Greenland itself was the North Pole at that time. As a matter of fact, they call it the land of timeless youth. And in the old Lyrian language, it was called Tirnan Og, and, uh, which is kind of a strange thing, strange language. Also, in those areas, it was very warm that the polar caps at that time were the tropical regions. That's where the palm trees were, and that was the origin of what's called golden apples. Today, we call them oranges. And that started in that particular area. Billy is a little... Um, had one other question about that because in, in a lot of old writings it talks about Hercules, Gilgamesh, Enoch, Emmanuel, and people like this all visiting that area uh, for certain reasons. And she says, yes, that's true, that most of them did, but Emmanuel didn't. By the time Emmanuel visited this land, the earth was not in that position, and it was back down to where Florida is now. So things have changed a little bit. Another question related to this secret city called Agharta that is sometimes talked about. He wanted to know if that was real. And it was told to him, yes, that Agharta actually is a real place, that there are descendants of some extraterrestrials who lived in the Mongolian desert in the city of Mu a long time ago. They had an underground city called Agharta, and it's located in the Gobi Desert somewhere between Shingatis and Shampula. 
That's where the capital city is. The interesting part was that they, much like the Bafath race that we're hearing more and more about, seem to have some designs on controlling this world, but apparently don't have the technology to do that. And they are ruled by a group called the Sons of the Sun. And like the Bafath, like I mentioned, they uh, don't have much use for the human race on the planet and would probably like to take it over if that was possible. Well, uh, at about this time, they're having, after they're talking a little bit, an android comes up to Patan and informs him that they don't really have to wait any longer, that the uh, extraterrestrial ship they were looking for that was lost in this other dimension has been found, and they can leave whenever they want to. So uh, they end this little jaunt into this other dimension, and they return back into our own current time with the other ship in tow, and Billy's had a chance to uh, see another dimension and take pictures of primitive life forms. Okay, we're up to January 7th, 1976 now. It's Billy's 42nd contact, and this is the telepathic contact. Many of them were. Uh, Billy had been so well trained in telepathic impulses that quite often, uh, when the weather was bad or they just wanted to get in touch with him about something, they would have telepathic. Now, this is not like channeling. Telepathic is much different than channeling. So, uh, matter of fact, Billy has... Uh, little regard for channeling. He regards that as just uh, kind of like self-induced meditation, euphoric meditation. So he says there's quite a bit of difference. Well, this is a telepathic contact, and primarily it's from Quetzal, the base commander, because uh, for a week or so before that, he'd been warning Billy that someone was going to take a shot at him, that there was going to be an attempt on Billy's life. Okay? Well, it did happen. Apparently, Billy was sitting in front of the glass window in the front of the house, and someone came and took a shot and uh, went right through the pane glass and just narrowly missed him, just shot right by his forehead. Well, Billy didn't think it was any big deal at all and didn't seem to express any fear. It was just a little 22, and he didn't take it too seriously. But Quetzal was making some attempt to try to find out who that was and track them down, and uh, Billy was curious about that. He said he'd like to know, uh, you know if you can find the person, let me know who it is and for what reason they might have for taking a shot at him. Um, also, in that, when they contact him, Billy says, well, while I've got you here, while you're willing to communicate a little bit, I have a few questions that I'd like to ask. And the questions were primarily centered around life in the Pleiades that some members of the group had wanted to ask. Uh, one of the things he asked was, uh, on the Pleiadian worlds, when someone dies, uh, do you have cemeteries? Do you bury people just like we do here? And they commented, well, of course we do. That uh, That is the natural way of doing things, uh, because that way the body material itself returns back into the, the ground just the way that it should. The cremation uh, was an unnatural thing, and they don't necessarily recommend it. They don't use cremation on the Pleiadian worlds. The reason was because the body fluids that stay inside of the body somehow. Interestingly enough, she says, when they do that, somehow those body fluids uh, have some relationship to relatives of the dead person who are still alive and didn't really expand on that, so I'm not sure exactly what they mean. The other question was life on the Pleiades, do they have houses? And uh, Quetzal and Semyasi both, who were in this conference t telepathic uh, call, uh, were kind of chuckling at this. Is of course, you don't think we live out on the ground. We have houses just like you do. The most of them are rather uh, round or oval-shaped. Uh, the interesting part is that they don't have large cities. They don't believe in congregating large groups of people. For one reason, uh, like I mentioned earlier, that it's uh, kind of unhealthy mentally. They seem to be, most of the planet seems to be quite telepathic and very mental, very much in tune with each other's emotions. But for the most part, everybody on the um, planet uh, gets an area about 100 meters by 100 meters of land to live on and a, and a home is provided for them and about all you have to do to uh, be eligible for that is to devote some amount of time which I believe is four hours a day to the society somehow in some sort of manner you contribute to your community and things are provided for you they don't have economics like we do no one works for money uh, there is no monetary or economic system if you pitch in and whatever your skills are, then things are provided for you. They have more of a wisdom system. It's kind of like you can do or you can grow to whatever your level of wisdom and understanding is, and then the jobs that you will do and provide and work in in your community are all dependent upon what you know. 
Amazing, huh? They don't have apartment houses. They don't have skyscrapers, again, because they don't like to clutter people together. They're very conscious of population control. And on the planet Era, E-R-R-A, which is one of the main planets and where Simyasi comes from, there's only about 450 million people on Era. They have uh, some sort of uh, kind of childbirth control, I guess you'd say. There's no more than three people, I mean, uh, three children per family. And they, as a general rule, they don't allow more than five people to live in any particular home. Billy says, well, that's nice. You've solved the mother-in-law problem. And they didn't understand what he was talking about. And she says, says Simeonazzi says, I don't get it. What's a mother-in-law problem? And Billy was trying to explain about how you get married, and sometimes your in-laws may move in and try to influence your marriage and take over your house. And he was being kind of silly, but they didn't get the joke. And Simeonazzi just says very straightly, well, mother-in-laws are called Geron uh, it's Geronessa, or Gernesia, I think it is. It's G-E-R-A-N-I-S-A, -S -S and I'm not sure exactly how you would pronounce that. So Geronisa, I suppose, something like that in their language. But she never did quite get the joke about what Billy was making about the, the mother-in-law. The next contact was on January 27th, on the 43rd contact. This was a physical contact, and uh, Simeonasi picked up Billy. And um, again, uh, Simeonasi was uh, explaining to Billy uh, about uh, people who are claiming to be contactees and who are really not. That they were very concerned that uh, people on Earth should find out, you know, who's really faking it, who isn't, because a lot of disinformation was going out with some people claiming that extraterrestrials were doing this or coming on behalf of a god or a religion or whatever. And she says this really isn't true. So Billy had um, asked her again about that, and he'd prepared a list of a number of people who had written books who were claiming extraterrestrial contact. And he wanted to know from her her comments if any of these were true. And uh, she said, well, there's far too many. He had about three pages of names. And she says, I don't have time for all that right now. But she says, list off a few of them, and I'll tell you whether or not they are false or not. And if they are contactees, if they are of any value as a contactee. And I'll just list a few of them here that might be interesting to us. There were names from uh, uh, contactees and uh, people who claim to be contactees from all over the planet, different countries. But I just put a few down here that are generally related to the United States because that's the only ones that we're particularly interested in. Uh, she said George Adamski uh, was completely false, that he had never had any contacts of any type. The whole thing was completely made up and that all of his photos that had been rigged and were just on glass plates. And I know there are a number of people who feel George Adamski uh, was a real contactor, but in this information anyway, the Pleiadian information, it states that no, he was not. Someone named Howard Menger, it just says he's of low importance. It doesn't clarify whether or not what kind of contact he may have. Someone named Bob Renaud, R-E-N-A-U-D, was of very low value, of no importance as a contactee. Someone named Mirashi, M-I-R-A-C-H-I, she says that's a positive one, there's something worth listening to there. Also someone named Venter, V-I-T-R, was of value and worth listening to. Another one would be Mantle, M-A-N-T-E-L-L, -L, and George Gorman. Uh, these were uh, people who had contacts that had something worth talking about. Someone named Dick Miller was a deceiver and had no contacts at all. A man named Frank Strangers who had written a book. She says his contacts were of no value, and she wasn't sure if he'd really had any physical contacts whatsoever. Uh, but she had had a look at the book and says it's misleading and there's no value to the book. So a little insight in there as far as 1975. And she did also add to that that they, even though she was sure of the things that she had said, uh, a lot of the ones that Billy had mentioned she had had to mark unknown because they just don't really keep track of everybody. And since 1975, there could be others, and some of these people have, may have even uh, you know, had contact since then, whatever. So that was the list as of 1975. After this contact, uh, it was time to go home, and it was pretty cold and snowy out. And uh, Billy was complaining, it's pretty bitter cold out there, uh, and uh, could I get a ride home, drop me off at the house? And she says, sure, I'll just drop you in the front, right in front of the house if you want. And he says, oh, my uh, moped, i got to take that. And she says, no problem. And she uh, picked up his moped, 
and it was floating along underneath the bottom of the beam ship. It was just being held by the anti-gravity device of some type. And before Billy could even say much of anything, he looked down, and he was already floating uh, in the ship just right in front of his house. And he noticed that, you know, there was lots of snow around and everything. He says, well, just put me down right here in front of the house, and then uh, I'll put the moped right here in front of the door. It'll make it look like I just rode the moped uh, for like six feet up to the door and stop. Then there'll be a nice tire track there. Everybody will come out tomorrow, and they'll see a six-foot tire track as if the moped just came out of nowhere, and he thought that would be great fun. And uh, she looked at him like, <laughs> okay, if you think that's funny, all right. As you can see, they have a lot of trouble understanding our humor sometimes, so uh, uh, Billy kept trying. Um, at one point, Billy received a letter that was kind of fascinating. We're always looking for collaborating information to uh, collaborate the validity of the Pleiadian case, and in one case, there was a pretty good one. I had told you earlier, at one point, uh, Semyasi was retrieving a time capsule. Um, I believe that was somewhere in Persia, and uh, she the time capsule that she'd returned to ask it on their uh, mission when they went to the other universe. Well, when she had picked up that time capsule, a couple of people had seen her. And uh, a letter came, uh, which is a few months after it actually happened. This letter came from a man, and he says that he had had an experience while traveling. He was a German man, and while he was traveling in that area, uh, one morning he had been woken up, and he heard a sound, and he walked over this hill and saw this lady digging in the ground. And she didn't seem too surprised. She was very friendly and talked to him for a few moments and told him that she was digging something up. And she pulled uh, this device out of the ground and said that she had to go now. And he just kind of stood there and uh, watched her pull the device up. And as she walked away, the device uh, started floating in the air right in front of her. And then she walked over the hill and disappeared. And the man was a little flabbergasted, not only to run into a, a nice-looking woman out here in the, the wasteland, but she, somehow this device was floating, and she just disappeared over the hill. So he runs to the top of the hill to see what's going on, to see if he can see this woman. And as he gets there, over the top of the hill, he's surprised because he sees a flying saucer. Well, he's traveling with a friend. And he runs back to the tent where they had been uh, sleeping, tells his friend all about what he's just seen. The guy thinks he's totally wacko, that he's going desert crazy or something, and decides that he doesn't want to travel with him any longer. It tells him that, you know, if he's going to act like that, he's too weird for him, and he separates. So um, he thought he was a little nuts, and uh, so he decided to uh, write a letter to Billy. He'd heard about Billy, and some friends had advised him that he might be interested in this sort of thing, so he sent a letter. And Billy was kind of surprised to get it. And uh, the man even commented, don't tell anybody that uh, I saw this or don't tell anybody my name because back in Germany when I return home, people will think I'm nuts and they probably put me in a madhouse. Well, uh, Billy confirms this with Semyas and she says, oh, yes, that's true. When I did pick the uh, time capsule up, that happened and I remember that man. So uh, someone did see uh, her pull the time capsule out of the ground, and we have a collaborating unsolicited letter then from a man who had been traveling through the east that he'd actually seen her and seen the ship. Okay, another interesting thing that came up on this contact was Billy had some questions about a uh, group in Berlin who uh, were talking a lot about St. Germain. And uh, some of you may know there have been a lot of mysterious claims about this man, St. Germain, uh, who was supposed to be from France and supposed to have lived for long periods of time and was a great master and could do this and the other and so forth. And so Billy had some questions about this and wanted to know if she knew anything about St. Germain. And she says, yeah, I can tell you a few things, uh, not too much, but what we do know on him is that his real name wasn't St. Germain. His real name was Rakoski, R-A-K-O-C-Z-I. I suppose you would pronounce that Rakoski. And his name wasn't St. Germain. That was his position. He had a position. He was the Count of St. Germain. He was born in Aries in 1711 in a little town called Colonia. And today it's called Colne. Uh, she says, to begin with, he was a complete liar, swindler, con man, and so forth, and took up working for the Rosicrucians at that time period. The reason was that 
The Rosicrucians were always trying to find ways to influence important people in government to empower their own self. Rosicrucians also, as many of you may know, have their own order of old science and uh, knowledge that they pass on to their initiated members if you stay in the Rosicrucians for a period of time. They have a lot of old world knowledge. Well, uh, this man, this man calling himself St. Germain, apparently was pretty good at magic and hypnosis and things like that. And um, they, uh, people of the Rosicrucians took up using this man to their own benefit. So what they did was uh, they would get St. Germain to amuse important people, kings, queens, and people of importance and so forth. Uh, and he would try to influence them on behalf of the Rosicrucians uh, for their own uh, you know, devices. Typically what he would do is he would hypnotize people. A lot of people weren't uh, aware of what hypnosis was, and one of his main things was to hypnotize women, find out all their secrets about themselves, then bring them out of the hypnosis and tell them they would remember nothing about it. And then he would just offhandedly, like he was a great mystic or magic or something, he would tell them all these things he just learned from them from, through uh, hypnosis, and they would be amazed that he would know so much about them. So he gained this reputation as being a great mystic and a magical person and a great master of thought and so forth, when in fact he was good at sleight of hand, good at magic, and pretty good at alchemy. He was never really a member of the Rosicrucians. He just claimed to be a member of what they call of the seventh beam, which means you would be one of their initiated ones and had access to all of their great knowledge and so forth. So he even had another little trick he would do where he claimed that he could uh, turn metal into gold. And what he was doing because of his knowledge of alchemy, uh, he just had some sort of chemical that he would put on plain metal and it would look like glare gold. That's what they called it. It would just shine and look like gold, but it really wasn't gold. And people were very impressed by this. He also would do a little trick now and then where he would hypnotize people. And when they were in the hypnosis, they'd think he would become invisible. They just couldn't see him, and it was a trick using hypnosis. But people would believe that he actually had the ability to move himself from one area to the other and become invisible, which really wasn't true. He also made many claims about being a great traveler and knowledge from different parts of the world, when in fact he never left the European theater at all. On one particular time uh, when he was going to Berlin, he was telling everyone that he was going to go to China and discover the great truths of China, when in effect all he did is he went to Berlin to report into the Rosicrucians there, uh, which is a splinter group of the uh, Rosicrucians, about some things that he was doing for them. The main office or the main stronghold of the Rosicrucians was in Vienna at the time. The Rosicrucians, it worked out so good for them to have St. Germain uh, appear to be working for them. They were gaining so much from it in the ways of secrets and knowledge and power and so forth in government that uh, they wanted to perpetuate this. And one of the ways was to make it look like the man never aged, like he was a great master in control of aged, like he was a great master in control of time. They were using chemicals on his face to make him look younger. And they had some tricks of their own to do this, so he always looked kind of young. Actually, the man, uh, the, the original Saint Germain, died at the age of 73. Uh, and since that time, uh, they've even tried to keep that legend going, claiming the man was alive. What they will do is they will find people who actually looked like the original man. They will do some facial work on him, maybe even alter it with surgery and with chemicals and so on, to make him look the same and perform the same kind of tricks and so forth on people to give the illusion that St. Germain was timeless, he was ageless, he was just going to live on forever. Okay, we're now ready for the 45th contact, which happened on Wednesday, February 25th, 1976. So you can see that Billy's contacts now have been going on for a little more than a year. At this point, uh, Sumyasi pretty much covered all the things that she wanted to say, and most of the contacts were usually centered around a lot of questions that Billy would have. So as the next year will go on here, we'll find that uh, most of the time Billy will have a series of questions with him uh, from members of the group and other people that uh, uh, he wants to ask Semyasi about. Uh, and so there'll be a lot of short answers here. For instance, uh, he had a question about the metal of the beam ships, which was asked by uh, some scientific type um, that had visited the house and wanted to know the answer if, if uh, they would reveal how they make the ships. 
This is why they can tell us a little bit that primarily it is a lead-based alloy that they use. And they actually extract the lead from water, plants, and from the atmosphere of planets which are he very heavy in lead content. Uh, they even use decaying stars, she says, quite often for that, that have heavy lead atmospheres. So they get the very soft lead alloy from that uh, place, and then they convert the soft metal uh, into a harder metal using some sort of conversion process. There's a couple of chemical processes involved also that make the lead much harder than our current steel. But even at that point, it's not quite ready to be into a beam ship. It has to undergo one other process, which she didn't want to talk about, because uh, she didn't want to feed us any more technical information than that. But she says, here on Earth, we have all the main elements, or most of them anyway, to make the alloy, which is primarily copper, nickel, silver, and some of them have gold in them. And she volunteered to bring Billy uh, a couple of samples of this. So he was excited about that. And it wasn't too long after that, by the way, she did bring him some samples. She brought him... Um, three samples and they're going to be given to Marcel Vogel at IBM in America and who um, did a pretty extensive analysis using the electron microscope on the different samples that were brought to him. As a matter of fact there is a um, videotape out called The Metal and it's uh, about an hour long and it's all uh, Marcel Vogel looking through the electron microscope analyzing the samples brought to him and explaining how they're made or so forth and he, his summary in the end of the videotape actually is that he could understand most all the particles that were in uh, the metal. He wasn't confused by that, but he said the manufacturing process at the moment was a process that was a little too advanced for us. It appeared to be a cold fusion process, and there wasn't any way with our current technology he felt we could put these metals together. Uh, Simyasi mentioned that they don't mine the metals on their own worlds. She says it's not really good for the planet. She says when you take precious ores and minerals and oils and so forth out of a planet, you're actually damaging the planet. We're not used to thinking of planets as living organisms, as creatures of the creation. They do. They regard a planet as an evolving creature, just like a human, but existing at a much lower consciousness. Because of that, she says, you shouldn't take oil, gas, and the precious uh, ores and so forth out of the planet, that you're actually hurting the planet in a way. And we shouldn't dam up our water either. It causes shifts in energy fields and even shifts somehow and geologically somehow, and she didn't elaborate on that. She was also very concerned that about her atom bomb testing. She says the underground atom bomb testing is very dangerous. Uh, as we explained earlier in the contact, you know, that it's affecting certain real sensitive uh, areas around the planet which affect the, you know, the small microorganisms. And she says one of the uh, really scary facts is that under the guise of atom bomb testing, we are told that they're testing bombs and so forth, that there is another program going on in secret by our government where they're testing what they call the doomsday device. She says it's not an atom bomb, that they've come up with another device, scarier than a bomb, that actually starts a chain reaction which causes the entire planet to just, as she calls it, atomize, just be self-destructed into dust. She says it would only take seven or eight minutes once this thing was set off uh, to totally destroy the planet in what they called a firestorm. So we've been experimenting around apparently with some very deadly devices, and this is back in the early 70s now. And uh, they are very concerned that if these get out of hand or they actually come to use, a chain reaction would be started. Seven to eight minutes, the entire planet would be ripped over by a firestorm, and the whole planet would actually be self-destructed. In another set of questions given to Billy by some astronomers, she commented on the age of the Earth. She says, which is 646 billion years old. Our sun is 1,730 billion years old. And she made reference again to our oil reserves. She says, we really only have about 27 and a half years left currently of oil reserves that we can actually get to. She says, you have to think of oil as actually a life form. It's uh, kind of like a, a germ to the earth, something like we might have parasites, you know, in our own body. Well, oil is also important to the planet itself. She says, the planet Earth is roughly, we've used up 65 billion tons of oil so far since we started taking it out of the ground. Interestingly enough, 
20 billion tons of oil have been destroyed or damaged by atom bomb testing. So here, on, geez, like a third of the oil that we've taken out of the planet, uh, we've run through atom bomb testing. A planet like Earth produces one billion tons of oil every billion years. And we've exploited about one-tenth of our total oil supply right now. The oil that's been taken out, uh, it would take almost twice as long for the Earth to replenish it because we've destroyed so many other elements in nature also. They, they estimate it would take about 118 billion years to replace the oil that we've taken out. She also commented that 35 years ago, which would put us back around 1940, that 86.1 percent of the Earth was fertile ground. Today, it's down to 39.7 percent. So there's been a lot of damage to the planet. The five most important things they felt we could do as far as uh, learning to live with the planet and to repair nature were one, reduce the population to under one billion because our heavy population puts strain on the social economic systems as well it puts a lot of strain on the planet because the thoughts, the subconscious thoughts of all of these people are too much really for the planet considering the most of our thoughts are very degenerate, hate, anger, depression, confusion and so forth which are not healthy for nature. Number two, stop robbing the earth of oil, gas, and ores. We are contributing to earthquakes and volcanoes, for one thing, by taking that stuff out, and we damage the planet. The planet will find a way to try to heal itself. We need to stop the atom testing, the underground explosions. That's obviously rather silly to do. Uh, not only is it contributing to earthquakes on the West Coast, it's damaging oil. It's sending all sorts of high-frequency oscillations and vibrations through the planet itself, causing other kinds of damage and it's damaging small microorganisms. We need to tear down all of the dams. Now that may sound like a silly little thing, but she says that's more important than we're really aware of. We shouldn't be damming the water up. It causes shifts in energy, and it causes it natural. Obviously, we're, uh, we're stopping the natural flow of water across the land mass, and we shouldn't be doing that. She also feels it's very important that we tear down all the nuclear power stations and quit trying to get power out of exploding atoms. It's very dangerous to nature, it's very dangerous to our health, and ultimately will lead to diseases and so forth, which we can not even imagine at this point. Okay, once again, it's time to turn the tape over. Fast forward, and I'll see you on the other side. We also, as they have examined the planet, we really have to do something about our political and our power system. Remember now, they look at us as a total planet. When they come down, they look at all the different countries, what's going on from the Saddam Husseins to the George Bushes to, you know, the leaders all over the planet. And without doubt, they can state that all of the countries are run by people set on greed and power with very little interest really in the general welfare or the quality of life. We have to stop this. She says if we don't, if the consciousness of the people, the mass consciousness, does not rise up and start taking charge of its planet, then we can almost be sure that we are de we're going to head towards a very difficult time of war when this firestorm they're talking about would be quite possible. We've already damaged the earth far too much, so we can expect a lot of volcano action. We're going to have a lot of climate alterations, storms, and water inbreaks. Now, this was she's talking about in 75. We're living in the 90s now. We're already seeing volcanoes starting to blow off. Uh, we're seeing the climate start to change. We're seeing storms, hurricanes, and cyclones uh, in different parts of the world, especially here in America and in uh, Hawaii, that are taking tolls that we didn't think were possible. Uh, <clears throat> she mentioned also that the whole countries will sink into the sea. It doesn't give them by name. It just says there will be large land masses that will slip under water and... Uh, a very large amount of people will die from that. Also, it's coming a very serious war. Uh, and they didn't say where or when it was going to break out here, but Billy apparently has most of that information that was provided to him through his telepathic transmissions from the Patali uh, uh, level. What they're doing is they uh, transformed his symbols and so forth so he can do uh, uh, Kabbalistic numerology, and he calculates these things to look into the future to see the things that are going to happen. 
Uh, we're obviously going towards a major war. We can't keep selling and providing all these third world countries weapons and so forth without expecting them to do something with them. Look just what happened with Saddam Hussein. Our great President George Bush and Baker uh, for 10 years provided funds to Saddam Hussein for whatever reason. It's kind of insanity. We should not be giving countries like this massive amounts of money, allowing them to build up all of their weapons. I have no idea what they were really thinking when they did that. At any rate, what happened? We had a war that we had to go stop them. It got out of hand, and George Bush had to convince all of us suddenly that Saddam Hussein was the bad guy, when for 10 years they have been building him up and supporting him and feeding him all these money and the ability to buy all these arms. Then suddenly we have to go stop the guy, using our young people, our money, and our military people, and trying to make us believe that this is a great idea. Well, things are a little out of hand. Um, she mentioned also that for, for ever, since for 2,000 years, the people who can foretell the future, people who do it Kabbalistic numbers, uh, that they, they calculate the future based on numeric values, that they have known for 2,000 years, again, this value of the 666, that this numeric value actually pertains to the word Jesus, God, Church, and Christ. There was no person named Jesus. Uh, Jesus never lived. There was a man named Emmanuel in the year 189 that changed his name to Jesus. The 666 and the Antichrist uh, stands actually for destruction of the truth. And it was the Christian church was destructive to the truth by not giving credit to Emmanuel and by changing the lessons of Emmanuel. Instead, they created the Christian church, gave it a name, the Christianity, changed Emmanuel's to Jesus Christ and created a God, a Lord of some kind and told the people this is the way it was. So they altered things. They altered the truth. So uh, what it's amounting to is Jesus is the value of the Antichrist, which is kind of an interesting awakening, huh? They also mentioned something else for those of us uh, or people who are very intrigued with this, that the abbreviations W, U, V have something to do with the Antichrist. They didn't want to reveal exactly who it was, but he's already he was already alive in 75. They didn't want to reveal exactly who it was, but they said that this um, symbol of the beast, which is uh, quite commonly uh, referred to as the sign of the beast, 666, that the beast isn't an animal, as many of us probably already know. It's just a symbol uh, for it. And it basically refers to an organization that has something to do with these initials, W-U-V. Now it concerns a worldwide organization which exists either in three locations or in three parts or something like that. It has something to do with a group, uh, there's three units or partitions to this organization. The organization will become embodied by the church and her followers. And Billy wanted to know, well, what does WUV mean? Is this an acronym for uh, the, the name of the organization? And she says, well, I'll tell you, but it's blanked out in the contact notes, and he's never told me either. Billy's very surprised. He says, because, she, this organization already exists, and it's already a major world organization. But then he says, the name is not very much like WUV. So it's um, whatever WUV stands for, uh, don't look for a name of a group using those initials. It's, it's related somehow other way. Billy also comments to Simiasi that there's a book by a man uh, in Egypt several hundred years old named Chero, C-H-E-I-R-O. And he says it's pretty interesting that the, the proper numbers for calculating future events are in this book. And Simeasi says that's right, because she says Chero actually lived about a thousand years ago, was a future seer, understood the numeric uh, ability, and actually could foretell the future quite accurately. So if any of you are into Egyptian books or studying that, you might want to try to find a book about Chiero, who predicted the future. They apparently say that he's quite accurate. Okay, the 46th contact was on Thursday, February 26th, happened quite shortly after that. It was interesting that as Billy's driving out to the contact on this one, he's being followed by a red car. Now, this car, he's seen this several times following him. Um, the interesting point was that Billy also had some people with him. And... Uh, 
Semyasi was having trouble, then she almost stopped the contact because the people uh, that were taking Billy out to the contact, she uh, did not know who they were. Their brain waves or the oscillations of their brain waves were new to her. And apparently the, they have a device in the ship that directs Billy to the landing location. And this landing, this device somehow uh, checks the people around Billy to see if they're all known people uh, and if some strange people might be following him. And on this particular day, uh, she noticed that the people with Billy were different and she had to reprogram their brain waves into the machine so it would know who they were. But this little red car was following Billy around. So she suggests, well, it's getting more difficult. More and more people are finding out about these meetings and following Billy every time he leaves the house. And so uh, they're going to have to have, probably start having these meetings even farther away and in more remote spots to keep them more secret. On this contact, she gave, uh, gave Billy some crystals, uh, ruby, malachite, and some fluoride. She also gave him the three metal samples uh, that he had asked for which constitute the third, fourth, and fifth processes in the steps they go through to actually make the metal for the bean ships. And she gave him a brief description of what these processes were like. The first step that it actually goes through is absorbing uh, the lead out of the atmosphere itself. They get this soft metal, they call it, uh, from the atmosphere and from plants. The second step is to clean that metal, the lead, and they extract different radiations from it. The third step is a heat process, very similar to our own, she says, where they heat the metals up and convert it into another alloy. Several steps are done of heating and cooling until it reaches a certain alloy state. The sixth step, is, she says, is a secret, which she can't really tell us, uh, which affects the whole alloy and causes some major conversing process. Well, Billy says it's some major conversing process. Well, Billy says, well, even after you make this metal, and I noticed on the ship it looks seamless, that there are no wells. How do you actually put this metal together so it's nice and smooth? She says they have a technique, it's kind of like welding, uh, but they call it an oscillation technique. And apparently what they do is they liquefy, excuse me, they liquefy the metal, and she suggested it's by some cold process, a cold fusion process somehow that this metal is actually liquefied. And at that point, the two joints that are coming together are actually melted in a way where they actually come together and move right into each other and become one piece. So it's uh, more advanced than our, uh, our welding process that we have. Our welding process leaves a little bead there, and we have to go along and file that down or grind it down and smooth it out. They don't have to do that. They literally just melt the two pieces together, and it looks like one. On our 49th contact, which is Sunday, and it's March 28th, uh, which is almost uh, uh, a month after the 47th, there was a 48th contact, and you'll notice I leave some out every now and then, because more and more of the contacts are becoming less information and more just general conversation about Billy, uh, his well-being, members of the group, things going on around the house, and they were becoming more just centered around Billy's life. And in quite a few cases, there was no information that was really relevant in these meetings. So I leave some of them out, mainly because uh, I just don't have time to put them all on, and most of them are kind of irrelevant. But there was a growing thing all the time, a pressure on Billy to uh, get his group people together, to analyze the thoughts and thinking of the people in the group, uh, to see if they were really going to be loyal or if they were going to, you know, out of fear, take off and cause problems or whatever. So there's a lot of social pressure going on here with Billy. On this particular contact, Billy is driven out to the contact by Mr. Schutzbach and Mr. Bertzinger. And again, the automatic guiding system was having difficulty because uh, these were new people. Uh, the system did not recognize their brain waves, and the contact was interrupted. And actually, Billy was being led to the location, and suddenly it stopped, and they had to stop along the road because Billy wasn't picking up any more signals. Uh, Simyasi had to reprogram the, the device or computer, whatever you call it, on board the ship to be familiar with these two new people so the contact could continue. So a few minutes went by and then the contact started up again and they again went off and dropped Billy off so he could have the contact. 
Uh, she says, actually, she had to finish the direction of Billy to the location by herself, and she would later uh, uh, load the information about the two new people into the computer so in case they came out again. This contact, Billy, shows up with two broken ribs. It seems that he'd been out on his moped. He gets himself too exhausted. He doesn't sleep. He works too hard. He's working too hard at this mission, doing all the things that he has to do, typing and getting his books together. He's so into it that he's just exhausting himself, and on his way out into the forest, he fell on his moped, fell into a ditch, and busted two ribs. Well, he shows up at the, uh, in the ship here for this contact with his two busted ribs, and Simeos is examining him, and of course, uh, she's kind of giving him a mild scolding here about the way he takes care of himself. It reminds him that he's jeopardizing this mission by not taking better care of his health. She says, well, I can't do anything about it now, but at the next contact, she says, I'll have him back right away, and I, I will bring a device that will heal these bones, so this will you know, heal very rapidly. Uh, also, what she does when she leaves, she puts on a little aerial display in the nighttime for Mr. Birdsinger and Hans Schutbeck so they can see the ship. And it lasts for about ten minutes. Now, neither one of these guys is expecting this. They're waiting down the road at some place called a pistol stand, whatever that is. I don't know, maybe it's like a place where you, you know, take your guns in like a firing range or something. But anyway, uh, after the contact was over, uh, Billy's just go walking down the road to meet back up with them. And for ten minutes, way up in the air, she puts on a light display uh, with the ship. And apparently this was huge because it involved thousands of meters high. It was seen for miles all over the place. And Mr. Uh, Bert Singer and Mr. Schutzbach were duly impressed. As a matter of fact, both of them wrote uh, long two- and three-page reports about exactly what they've seen because they were pretty blown away to uh, drive Billy out to a contact and then get to see this, you know, on their first time out. So um, as far as collaboration, we have two more witnesses here who didn't see the shape of the ship, but they saw the ship going through gyrations and causing lights and so forth in the sky. On the 50th contact, uh, which was... Uh, uh, not long after that, Billy's followed again. And this time he's got about uh, five people with him. And uh, he's being followed again by a little Volkswagen with a parabolic screen on it on top of it that's chasing him around. And uh, he's also being followed by this red car again. So there's more and more people are dogging him every time he goes out to try to have a contact. So Simeasi sees that someone is following, is right close behind. And as a matter of fact, this person is so close behind him, it's interfering with the contact itself. So she interferes. And she sends an electrical charge of some type into the car hitting the magneto and causing the car to fail so it can't continue to follow Billy. And she says, it looks like uh, we're going to have to find more and more secret places for these meetings and uh, ways of you know, getting you out of the house. Okay, also on this contact, Billy had brought with him five or six of his friends, and uh, they were going to be allowed uh, at the end of the contact to see the ship. Uh, Simiasi was uh, exposing herself, I guess you might say, more and more to members of the group because she was encouraging Billy to get the group together and to, trying to encourage the group members to come forward to help with the mission. So uh, more and more the people of the group are being uh, able to see the ship and hear more of the information from Simiasi. Well, Billy has a couple of broken ribs, so she brought with her a device of some type uh, that will take care of that. And she tells him to set uh, in this particular spot between two poles. It said that's all it says. It's just Billy sets between two poles for a couple of minutes, and the bones are mended. So some sort of field is generated by these poles, causing rapid healing. She says you wouldn't even be able to tell that the bones were ever broken. The skin, though, uh, still around the ribs is still inflamed, and that's going to be sore for a while. Billy has a question about the American government. Uh, he says there are rumors that the American government has crashed uh, UFOs, and they have bodies of uh, little ETs and so forth. He wants to know if there's any truth to that. And she says, yes, it is, that the American government has material from a destroyed spaceship. She says they don't have a real spaceship, but, and the pieces that they do have are so banged up that they wouldn't be able to tell anything from it anyway. And they do have, uh, they have some dead bodies. She didn't say how many. She says they have dead bodies of little dwarf-like ETs. Uh, but she reiterated that they do not have any functioning ships. 
The only one to notice is, is, is there an underground base at Unterberg, wherever Unterberg is. And uh, he had been hearing rumors that there was an extraterrestrial facility there. She says, no, it's not extraterrestrial. There's no ETs there. What it is is there's a group of Earth people who had built an underground facility. It was not a government. It was an independent group. And they were using the German plans that were around during World War II to build their own flying disc. And they've been reasonably successful. She says, actually, they have flying discs. It cannot leave the atmosphere of the planet. But she said that the disc have quite a few capabilities and are very advanced. And these people like to pretend that they're ETs. And she wasn't ex uh, exactly sure why, but apparently they're trying to uh, either fool people as a joke or they're trying to, like, you know, say they're ETs to cause, you know, people to follow them or whatever. Again, just being deceitful. So if you hear about an underground base at Unterberg with flying discs, don't be too quick to think that they're extraterrestrial. It's our own people. Billy asked about these supposed tunnels that run underground uh, around the planet. And she says, of course. In earlier times that the uh, ancestors of the Earth people, there were tunnels built all over the planet. And there was a complete underground system. Most of them are kind of damaged system. Most of them are kind of damaged because of earthquakes over the years, and they're not fully functional any longer. And she noted that the one in Guatemala had been crashed uh, because of an earthquake and was no longer, um, it wasn't there, it just filled in. In response to another question, she says the Pleiadians do not smoke. Uh, they don't drink like we do, but she says they do have something similar to alcohol. They do have drinks that are something like that. But apparently, she says that, uh, they have it, but they apparently don't use it. They don't have a drinking problem like we do. Now, we have a drinking problem because it's big business. You know, it's always puzzled me why the number one problem in the United States, alcohol, uh, creates so many problems with our young people, uh, even our old people. I mean, alcoholism is a serious problem in this country, and we do nothing to stop it because the revenue from alcohol is huge. You probably don't know this, but the revenue from alcohol is the second largest revenue in the government. It's only uh, exceeded by income tax. So alcohol is very important economically. That's why we support it. Uh, not that it has any, uh, any good for our society. We should just stop alcohol, but oh, no. Simeonsi mentions again that not only is she going to give a demonstration for the five women who are waiting, they're all five of them are women, and she says it's no accident that you brought five women tonight, that she had been sending telepathic thoughts to these five women, and Billy wanted to know what about. And she says, well, that's none of your business. It's just between us and the women, me and the women. And Billy was a little surprised, and he says, you mean you have secrets? She says, well, not really secrets. It's just women talk. And apparently she was kind of getting to know these women and sending them thoughts and so forth, and uh, Billy wasn't really privileged to that. Um, before that uh, contact ended, Simiasi again had to refer to Billy about uh, having so much difficulty taking care of his family. Billy was making such an issue about it being anti-materialist, about not uh, you know, getting his books out, not speaking for money, uh, not providing any income for his family, that not only was his family suffering, but the mission was going to suffer from it also. And she was literally almost scolding him how he keeps evading this, where he is, has worked so hard all the time on his books and his writings, but he's, his leadership abilities are nil. And um, ultimately, this is what stops the contacts anyway after a while, because they finally just don't want to go on with this, because... He's not handling his leadership correctly, either for his group or for his family. Okay, we move up to the 51st contact, which was Tuesday. Uh, and that was on April 27th, 76. And uh, Billy is told, to his surprise, that this one of these little cars that's been following him around is actually his old friend Hans Jacob. And that Hans has become a little embittered by Billy and has turned against him. And Billy, without knowing it, is, has an enemy now. And that Hans Jacob, who he thought was his loyal friend, is now working with other groups of people against Billy and is responsible for either one or some of the cars that follow him to the contacts. So Billy's rather surprised by this because he has, I guess you would call it, sabotage and intrigue going on in his own group. 
quite often the Pleiadians would have to step in and examine the thoughts of the people around Billy and watch for ulterior motives. And it happened rather frequently. There was a lot of jealousy and so forth within the group members. And here we have a case of Hans, who is one time his closest friend and going to be his speaker and lecturer on behalf of Billy, is now working against him. Billy has a question about the age of Earth. Earlier he was told by Simiasi that the Earth was 626 billion years old, and he's told this to an astronomer who doesn't believe it and says that he's all wrong. And so he's asking Simiasi for a lengthier explanation that might serve for this astronomer. She says, well, no, it is true. The Earth is 626 billion years old, but they age the Earth from the formation of the gas ball. And Earth technology at the moment has no way of doing that. We can only age things in the material form. She says, uh, the Earth began to form in the gaseous state 646 billion years back. It took 600 billion years for the Earth to solidify. Then it took over 40 billion years for the Earth to evolve up to the point of where the human being then came upon the Earth, evolved naturally on the Earth. So there's only traces of the human form of life in any shape uh, back six uh, billion years. So she says uh, it's unfortunate that your astronomer that they have not advanced to the point yet where they can you know, uh, be able to judge the age of planet bodies uh, back to the gaseous state, but our technology is coming along. Okay, that's about all that was any value on that contact. The 52nd contact was on Monday. Um, that was on May 17th, 76. Billy's asking about a uh, race of giants in Peru. There's something in the news uh, about a race of giants that are coming up from underground cities and kidnapping uh, the white women and they're disappearing to women with them. And he wanted to know about that. And she said, yes, um, that is true. It's happening that uh, there is a race of uh, red, kind of red brown skin Indian looking uh, beings there and they are the old enemies and descendants of the Incas. About 500 years ago they went underground to hide out, very seldom come up, but uh, they will be doing so more and more in the future because of volcanoes and other reasons they're being forced out from underground. There are tunnels all over South America and apparently there are any number of old uh, ancestors of old races uh, living down there in these subterranean places and they're tall, they're giants, they're about 200 centimeters tall which I don't know how that relates to inches, I haven't learned my metric conversions yet so if you're a metric person they're, they're average 210 centimeters tall. Um, a uh, Mr. Guido Moosberger at this time from Austria becomes a friend of Billy's and starts getting involved in the contacts. Guido, by the way, has just written a wonderful book uh, all about Billy's life and his touring in America giving some talks, so there'll be some insights there at the personal level. One of uh, Mr. Uh, Moosberger's, Guido's, first questions he had for the Pleiadians was about the curse of the Pharaohs. He wanted to know if there really was such a thing. And she says, no, there really wasn't a curse. They didn't have the ability to actually curse, you know, the future. But knowing that their graves would be robbed and so forth, and that their bodies, even their sarcophagus, would be open and so forth, they wanted to defend themselves as best they could. So they found a poison that's taken from the small little spine-like hairs from the Fijindus cactus. Now, I may be pronouncing that wrong. I'm not up on my cacti. But uh, it says Fijindindus, F-I-G-I-D-I-N-D-U-S, cactus. And it has a poison that will last a long time, maybe even up to a thousand years. The pharaohs, knowing this, after their bodies were wrapped, they would take these very small hairs, which are even very hard to see, and they would put the hairs in the body wraps of their body. So in the future, when people would come in to rob the sarcophagus or the coffin, whatever, and if they would touch you know, the wrappings around the body and so where they would get in their skin and it would kill them. This was one of the defense uh, mechanisms they built in. Not knowing this, people think that somehow just being in the, the coffin area that they're being, you know, affected by a curse, but there is no curse. She went on to explain about the pyramids that at the time the pyramids were built, which again was 73,300 years back from 1975 by our earliest, earlier uh, descendants, the Lyrians, that uh, when they were built, the astronomers of the time apparently were quite astute. Well, they would be if they were, uh, you know, ETs from another planet, if they were Lyrians, and they would have a lot of knowledges that the local Earthmen did not have. 
she says they could see into the future and they could see that there were great cosmic events that were going to uh, come upon the earth and cause major destruction and that they actually built information and data about these coming events into the pyramid. This uh, information has to do with disasters that are somehow going to come upon the earth because of something from the cosmos. They even took into account when they designed these pyramids the fact that the axis would change and they knew coming events were going to happen that would cause the earth to actually change its rotation and positioning and they took that into account also. So these were pretty sharp guys. There is a prophecy then in, built into the data in the numeric system of the Great Pyramid of Giza. Great Pyramid of Giza. And it speaks of a time at which the central sun of the Milky Way and our own sun system will shine through a tube-like opening in the pyramid into the center of the pyramid and illuminate at one particular point. Now, I've been in the Great Pyramid, and I know what she's talking about. I actually tracked these tube uh, things down. The uh, Egyptians and the people that are over there refer to them as just air vents, and they're clogged up. So at some point, uh, if the sun ever does try to shine through them, it is never going to happen because they're filthy. The Egyptians that live there now, which are all Arabs, there are no more Egyptians in Egypt, really. Well, actually, there are. They, there's about 40,000 left. They've kind of gone the way like the American Indian. The country was overrun by Arabs, and the Egyptians are all just like scattered in the southern regions. But they don't take care of the pyramid at all. They really don't care anything about it past just picking up a few piastras, they're called. That's their uh, money. They're called piastras. I think it's about 30 piastras, you know, to get in to see the pyramid. That's all they really care about. And they give you all sorts of hokey stories over there about the pyramid and when it was built. Just anything to kind of amuse you, you know, to make some money. But she said that... Um, that's what it was all about, that at one particular point, the central sun of the Milky Way and our sun will be in alignment, and they will shine a light through one of these holes. And there is, when you go into the king's chamber, and I don't remember which wall it's on. You can have to catch me there on direction. I think it's on the east wall, but I may be incorrect. If you ever go there, look on the wall in the king's chamber, and you'll, you'll find the air vents. You can't see any light coming through them. You have to feel around for them. As I remember, it's a small hole. It's probably three or four inches in diameter, and it extends all the way up to the surface of the pyramid, and that's what they're talking about. You could probably, once you've found the location in the King's Pyramid exactly of where that air hole is, then you could probably plot uh, astrologically at some point whenever the uh, central sun of the Milky Way and our central sun line up and could shine through that hole, then you'd probably figure out some rather interesting stuff. And if you could uh, learn about the geometry of the pyramid uh, and find the numbers from that, that the data used to build the pyramid apparently speaks of future predictions. The pyramids were not built by uh, 100,000 Nubian slaves rolling the stones over blocks. Uh, the people of those time, the ancient ancestors, our ancient ancestors from the Lyrian area, uh, used spiritual powers actually to build the pyramid, telekinetic forces. In other words, the ability for the mind to move matter. That was the main way that the pyramid was built. If you have ever or get the opportunity to climb inside the Great Pyramid, you'll agree with that quickly, as once you see the size of the stones and the way it's put together, it's hard to imagine how anyone could actually build this thing out of blocks with normal manpower. Simyasi came to um, in Quetzal, both suggested to Billy uh, also on this contact that... Um, at their last contact where they'd set the ship down, uh, apparently the local army had been out there uh, following them, and there was helicopters in the area examining the area, so apparently they knew where the uh, saucer was setting down for that contact, and they were out there with their devices trying to detect any radiation on the ground and so forth where the ship was set down. So they were a little surprised that, uh, that their contacts were uh, being picked up on, and they were again going to have to become more secret about what they're doing. Apparently, maybe some of these uh, little Volkswagens with little parabolic uh, screens on them could be government type people following them, just trying to pinpoint the location where Billy goes to and to find out whatever they could. There's another attempt on Billy's life. This is the second one that I know of. Uh, he wasn't particularly concerned about this, and as a matter of fact, Simiasi had to kind of wrestle the information out of him to find out about it. And he says, well, it really wasn't a big thing that he had dreamed and seen a future vision of this actually happening three times. So he felt quite well warned. 
and uh, he knew exactly who was going to come and when, and he felt uh, uh, was very comfortable that his dream was accurate, so he wore a metal uh, plate under his clothes, and when he got shot, it was just a small little twenty two again, and it happened to hit him right in the pocket in his chest, or his agenda book, he calls it. And there's a picture in Billy's photo journal of the little agenda book and the shell that hit him in the pocket, and the shell just fell in his pocket. And uh, But he wasn't caused any damage, and he actually was not even afraid. Uh, actually, I think he felt uh, pretty good that he was able to foresee it and protect himself. I Okay, we move up to the 54th contact now, which was on June 8th, a Tuesday in 1976. A few little interesting uh, things were brought out there. Simyasi uh, gave a demonstration for the whole house uh, the, the night before this contact, and apparently she had several of their little telemeter devices. These are little small saucers that are unmanned, they're remotes that fly around the planet all the time collecting information uh, about our languages and what's going on in different places of the world. Apparently she had two or three beam ships and a few telemeter devices that hovered over Billy's house and the whole household got to come out and watch as they floated around. must have been very exciting. And she uh, noticed that there was two people visiting in the house from Germany that she was not aware of. And she commented to Billy that she had also recorded their brain patterns in the ship so she would know who they were in the future. I mentioned on an earlier tape that Billy was rejoined with Ascot when he went on a trip with uh, the Pleiadians to the Great Spacer. And on that picture, which is circulated around, there's a lot of confusion about what looks to be her earlobes. And many people think it's just hair. Uh, I thought I'd clear that up. They are earlobes. It is definitely earlobes that Ascot's people, who are called Timmers, they're from the Dal universe, a separate universe from ours, that Ascot's earlobes not only are lower, but they come down almost to the bottom of the jawbone, and they're forward set on the face. They're not as far back as our earlobes are. They're a little far, uh, closer to the front. So when you look at that picture, it's a little deceiving because she has white hair, and it kind of blends in since the picture's not real sharp. It blends in and looks like it could possibly be her hair, but it is not. Uh, it is her earlobes. Billy had a cute little question about do the size of earlobes have anything to do with intelligence? And she kind of laughs, says, of course not. If it did, uh, consider that the most intelligent thing on earth would be a jackrabbit. Simiasi has blue eyes, by the way, and does use, uh, I guess we'd call it eyeliner. She uses some makeup and remarked that most of the Pleiadian women use some form uh, of uh, makeup, we'd call it, to like you know, add to their general looks. They don't use very much, but they are into some sort of especially eye shadowing. Simiasi lives on a planet called Ira in the system of Tegeta. Uh, she has concerned herself on Earth, she says, for about 72 years, but she's only been on Earth actually for four years physically. So those previous years were all mostly in research. Currently, the Pleiadians, there was about 114 of them visiting Earth at the time. That number can vary from 50 to 300. They have three bases on Earth. One's in Switzerland. Uh, at the time, in the contact notes, uh, she says she couldn't tell Billy where the others are at, but uh, Billy told me later on he learned that one was in Russia, and uh, they had built one underground in the southwestern part of the United States, but abandoned that one in 1981. And there was a lot of activity in the North Sea. It was never clear if they were just doing something there or they actually had a base under the water there somehow. There, at that time, were seven other extraterrestrial bases on Earth, and probably still are, possibly might be some more now. She says they all know each other. Uh, they are all familiar with what each other is doing, and they are all friendly towards one another, so that's a good sign. Another question about um, spiritual evolution, Billy wanted to know if animals in nature evolve just like people do. And she says, no, it's different. That animals do not strive for perfection. That animals are actually a form of spirit created by creation, which really only strive for the evolution of nature itself, she calls within a set order, is how she explained it. What that actually means is, the human being strives for perfection and ultimately has the ability to join in with creation itself. Animals do not. They have kind of a limit on how far that they can evolve. And their evolution isn't based on growing wisdom like ours is. Instead, it's more like they strive for instinct develop, 
development. Where they're, and also, I know their life cycle is different. Billy explained to me once, and I'll go more into the life cycles of the, on the other tapes of creation when we get to it. But in nature, uh, animals have a fixed turnaround period. When they go through, uh, like we, we die and pass on and go to the fine matter world. And when we come back, is determined by other factors, which I'll get into later. But uh, the animal world is controlled. It's kind of on a, uh, a calculated numbering system. They always come back the same number of years. So it's more of a controlled, instinctive system with animals. Animals, again, are not part of the human evolution. The human spirit form did not evolve out of the animal world. Creation created the animals and then all of the nature spirit forms separately from the human spirit forms. At such a time on the planet when the planet was evolved enough for human life form to be here, the human spirit form was created and evolved out of a different level of intelligence for different reasons and to operate in a different manner, like I said. It's a wisdom system, which I'll explain more about later on. So we did not evolve out of any animals or any form of nature. There's confusion about that because the anthropologists are always trying to relate us somehow, that missing link, to the monkeys and so forth, which is not true. As I explained to you earlier, quite a few of the unusual monkey types actually were created out of experiments from our early ancestors who were using human genetics and mixing it with animals, and that's where most of the monkey types actually came from, including the Bigfoot sort of thing. Uh, Billy asked how their radios work. If it was, uh, you know, just dial in like we do, but how do they communicate like from planet to planet? And if they're a long ways away, uh, radio waves are far too slow to get an immediate answer. It could take you know, thousands of years to get an answer as slow as radio waves are. She says, well, our radios don't operate in normal space. We send our messages through hyperspace, much like we do the ships. They actually attach their message, whatever it is, to particles that we call, she says, they're similar to the particles that we call tachyon particles. And these particles can be accelerate in hyperspace. It speeds way beyond the speed of light and almost instantaneously uh, reappear at some other location in the galaxy. So they have learned how to build radios which actually send messages through the hyperspace so they can hear each other immediately at different parts of the galaxy. There were some questions on gravity, like what is it, uh, can we do it, and uh, what could you explain about that? And it kind of caught her uh, off guard because at first she says, well, I'm not allowed to talk about that. that. Again, you know, that we see you so far out of balance with your technical development that we are not really interested in supplying you information that you don't need. Uh, you don't need to know about anti-gravity yet because the last thing you need to do is get off your planet. Uh, you need to spend more time with your social development. But she offered a few insights into that. She says it is electromagnetical in nature. There are two unitary but contrary forces. And here's kind of a key phrase. She says that the Earth generates the gravity. Now, generates may be a key here. It's... Um, the cause of the gravity, she said, also can be found in the self-warmth of the planet and the cold of space. So there's something to do with this, uh, the difference in temperature between the coldness of space and the warmth of our atmosphere that also contributes to the gravity itself. She says another contributing factor is the core of the planet, which is very dense. And that's also a contributing factor. So there are several things involved here in the creation of the gravity. But the planet is generating it. Temperature has something to do with it. Mass has something to do with it. I think that um, probably in different private circles here on our planet, uh, people have probably already kind of figured that out. And it would be interesting to see if their explanation uh, falls in line with Billy's notes. Among other questions was about the Pleiadians themselves. Uh, she remarked that the Pleiadians live in a solar system of nine planets. We believe that ours has nine, but uh, later on they're going to tell us that there's actually 11. There's two kind of uh, renegade planets far out floating around that we hadn't discovered yet. But there's nine planets in their solar system. On the planet Era, which is the planet that Simyasi comes from, there are 400 me approximately 400 peop uh, million people living on that planet. Uh, she says when her earliest ancestors had come to Earth on several occasions, the ancient Lyrians and so they were familiar with Earth. And when they left Earth and returned back to their own world, at a certain point, uh, they fled out into the world themselves and they found a planet very similar to Earth, just like it. Uh, the planet era uh, has 365 and a quarter days. 
A day is 23 hours and 59.4 seconds long, which is pretty amazing that it rotates that accurately to Earth. The Pleiadian word for a day is musal, M-U-S-A-L. A second, a word for a part second, they call it, is odor, O-D-U-R. A year is 13 months long with a compensation time every 23 years. So they're doing a little different calendar than we are. The word for a month is an ASAR, A-S-A-R. Um, their atmosphere is 70 to 75 percent nitrates, 25 to 29 percent oxygen, and about 1 percent rare gases like carbon dioxide and aragon. Argon, excuse me, not aragon, that's a ballroom someplace. Argon. Era has a little higher oxygen content. It's 32.4 percent higher than the other planets. Their surface gravity is 1.003. Density is 5.521. Axis inclination is 22.99 degrees. The equatorial diameter is 12,749 kilometers, and their planet is moving through space at 11.19 kilometers a second. So there's some statistics for the astronomy types if you want to do some comparison there. Uh, to the planet Earth. Uh, she says on, uh, compared to our calendar, uh, that she was born actually on February 7th. That was Simeon's birth date. She says the Pleiadians are very much into astrology, but they know far more about it, and their astrology is far more accurate. That there is definitely, definitely, something to the concept that the radiations put out by planets do affect life. There's no doubt about it. <clears throat> she just commented that Earth astrology is not very accurate at this point. That more has to be learned about how these radiations actually affect the human spirit. What? Another uh, interesting subject that was brought up at the 55th contact, Monday, that was on June 14th, Simyasi has a brother uh, and a sister. Her sister's name is Pleja, P-L-E-J-A, and her brother's name is Yukata, which sounds kind of Japanese. It's Y-U-K-A-T-A. -A. Now, again, let me reiterate, I don't believe any of these names of planets or anything because it doesn't make any sense that uh, they would all have the sameness of sound. Uh, you know, even on our own planet Earth, you go from one language to the other, and all the sounds and the styles of language are all different. But here in Billy's notes, everywhere he goes, the planet names, system names, galaxy names, universe names, people names, they are obviously all from the same language. They're all with the same phrasing and so forth and lettering and spelling. So I don't believe that actually they're using correct names. I think for the most part that many of these names are probably just uh, uh, made up for these particular contacts or whatever, but uh, that's my opinion at any rate. I don't think Simyasi is probably even her real name, and I don't think Pata is her father's real name. These are probably just names they've used you know, for this particular mission because these are words that mean something in their language that refer to them, but it's not really their own names. They've tried pretty much throughout all the contexts to kind of keep their personal thing private. Um, Billy comments that his wife is getting now, coming around and getting very interested in the context. She'd had a lot of difficulties previous to this, but it's coming around, and Simeon says she knows, and that she's going to extend some thoughts to Billy's wife and offer her some help in her own spiritual growth. Pata, Simeon's father, is 759 years old. And I've got a little space on the tape here, I think, just to tell you one more thing, which is ice ages. Ice Age is a natural event in the evolution of a planet. You know, and we're going to find out more in the creation tapes about how all life goes through cycles of off and on and awake and sleep periods. Well, a planet does the same thing, and it does it by virtue of an ice age. The planet we have to start thinking of is a living creature also. It has to evolve like anything else. It has a very low consciousness, not much of a personality, but we have to start looking at it like that. Ice ages are a way for the planet to go through its own evolutionary stages. It has to sleep also. Okay, again, we're running out of tape, so we'll continue with the Ice Age on uh, next tape. See you over there.